If you want to share data, you will use the RC smart pointer. And if you want to mutate a data without passing a mutable reference, then you will wrap the data inside a ref cell. Combining RC and ref cell, we can create a data that is shared and also mutable. An example of this is creating multiple lists that share a common tail. However, ref cell and RC are only safe to be used for single threaded programs. For multi threaded programs, we need to use ARC and mutex. ARC and mutex are like RC and ref cell that are safe to be used across threads. So in this video, I'll explain how to use the mutex. We'll first import the modules that we're going to need. Mutex, mutex card, and thread. To create a mutex, we type mutex new. Inside the function new, we put in a data that we want to put behind the mutex. For this example, let's put a number zero of the type i32. Let's assign this to a variable. I'll also show you the type over here. The type is a generic type. Since in this example, we're using i32, this will be i32. Now to show you that a mutex is like a ref cell that is safe to be used across threads, let's spawn a thread. Thread spawn. Inside the closure, we'll modify the data behind the mutex. To modify the data behind a mutex, we first need to call a function called lock. This will return a result. For now, let's simply unwrap the result. And then let's assign this to a variable. The type that is returned here is called a mutex card. It's generic over the lifetime and the data that is behind mutex. For this example, we'll put a placeholder lifetime. We don't need to worry about the lifetime yet. The other data type is the data that is behind the mutex. In this example, this is i32. This mutex card represents our data. We can read it and also write to it. If you wanted to write to this, we'll need to prefix this with the mute keyword. Since it's behind a mutex card, to modify it, we'll first need to dereference this mutex card. And let's increment the number by one. Next, let's print the value behind the mutex at the end of the main function, println. We also have to tell the main thread to wait for this thread that is spawned to finish execution before finishing execution for the main function. So let's assign this to a variable, the handle, the join handle, and then say handle.join.onwrap. Okay, let's execute the code. And you'll see that there is a compilation error. It tells us that we need to put the move keyword in front of the closure. So in front of this closure, we need to say move. Move the ownership of the mutex into the thread that we spawn. However, you'll notice that if you try to move this mutex inside the thread, then we won't be able to print this out. And to show you this, you're going to see that the code will not compile. Now, one way to fix this is to use the arc. I'll explain how to use the arc in the next video. In this video, there's another way to be able to move the mutex inside the thread without calling the move keyword. And you might already know how to do this. In the previous video, we talked about scoped threads. Scoped threads will allow us to reference a data inside the closure without moving the ownership of that data. So let's change this to scope. Inside the function scope, it's going to give us a single input, the scope. And now inside here, to spawn a thread, we say scope, spawn, and then pass in the closure. For scoped threads, we don't need to call the function join. So we'll remove this line. Okay, let's now execute the code again. And this time the code compiles and executes without any errors. At the end of the main function, it prints out the mutex with the data equal to one. Now to show you that this mutex is safe to use across threads, let's spawn another thread and then execute the same code. In the first thread, we increment the value B by one. And in the next thread, we increment the value by one again. So at the end of the main function, when we print this mutex out, we expect that the value to be equal to 2. Execute the code, and we get that the data is equal to 2. So that's a basic example of how to use the mutex. Put a data behind a mutex by calling the function new, and if you wanted to look inside it or write to it, you'll need to call the function lock. Now, why do we need to call the function lock? The function is called lock because when we call the function lock, other threads do not have access to this data. And to show you this, the simplest way is to create two locks. What you're going to see is that the first part is going to get a lock and the second line is also going to try to acquire the same lock. But since the locks still exist, this part of the code will block. Let's execute the code again and you'll notice that the main function doesn't finish execution. So this is because we acquire a lock and on the next line, it's trying to acquire a lock again. The code is being blocked over here. To release a lock, we need to drop this lock. And the simplest way to drop this lock is when the lock goes out of scope. At the end of this closure, this lock will go out of scope, so it will be dropped. So what you need to remember is that once you acquire a lock, you'll need to make sure that you drop the lock. 
Otherwise, your code will block and your Rust program will not finish execution. For the last part of this video, I'm going to explain why we need to call the function unwrap. When we call the function lock, it returns a result. The calling the function lock may fail, hence it returns a result. Now, can you imagine a situation where the lock function will fail? Well, here is one situation. We spawn two threads, and inside the threads, we try to acquire a lock. But what happens if one of the thread panics without releasing the lock? For example, let's simply panic this thread. So what's going on here is it acquires a lock and then the thread fails. Imagine what's going to happen inside the other thread. It's trying to acquire a lock, but since this thread panicked without unlocking the lock, we expect that this part of the code will return some kind of error. And to see this, instead of unwrapping, let's see what the result is. We expect that this part of the code will return an error. Print ln lock result, and then simply try to print out this result. Execute the code. We see that the result is an OK, and in the next thread, it fails. This is because when we executed this code, this thread executed first, followed by this thread. If we execute the main function several more times, I expect that at some point, this thread will execute first, followed by this thread. And in that case, we'll see that this result is an error. So I'm going to execute this program several times until we see an error. OK, here it is. Here's the thread that we intentionally panicked, followed by the error. Lock result of the error poison error. So this is an example of when the lock function returns an error. What we saw was that we acquired the lock and inside the thread, it panicked. When another thread tries to acquire the same lock, it returns an error, since the other thread panicked. So in this video, I showed you some examples of how to use the mutex to read and write to data safely across threads.